Good evening, economic students. Uh, so we're going to talk now. We're still in chapter 13. We're still in chapter 13. We're going to talk about public goods tonight. Uh, public goods are, well, we'll define them in just a second, but we're in chapter 13, and this is part of the second half of the section. Well, it's 13.3. So find 13.3 in my second edition book. That's page 298. So what is a public good? Well, your book gives a pretty good definition. Public goods have two defining characteristics. They are non-excludable and non-rivalrous. Now, what non-excludable means is they're goods that it's virtually impossible to cut somebody out of. Um, for example, national defense is a public good. If you are a person living inside the United States, you get the benefits of living under the umbrella of protection that our national military provides for us. It's non-excludable in that if you're living in this country, you're going to get the benefit of being protected by our military, whether you like it or not. You might thoroughly dislike the military, but it doesn't change the fact that if you're inside the country, you're being protected by from forces outside the country attacking you by our military. So it's not excludable because there's really no way to cut anybody out of it. If it's a public good, it's either impossible to cut somebody out, like in national defense, or extremely difficult. Um, I, I can't even think of an example where, what would be an example of something that would be extremely difficult are very costly to cut someone out of. Well, okay, I guess <laughs> uh, you could put somebody on a piece of land and build a 150 foot, 10 mile wide cement barrier around them and that would protect them from things outside and they never have to worry about being protected by our military again. But you know, that's just kind of craziness. Not excludable essentially means it's impossible to, to deprive someone of the good if they're part of the class that the good protects, citizens of the United States in that case. Um, the other element of a public good is it's non-rivalrous. Um, now, a private good. Let's think about a private good. A private good is excludable. If I buy a medium pizza, and it is my pizza, I bought it, I have the perfect right to say, none of the rest of you people can have any of my pizza. It's my pizza, and I'm eating the whole thing by myself. No one else on earth has a right to eat any of my pizza. It's private property. It is a private good, that pizza. Um, so that is a totally private good, totally excludable. I can say nobody else has a right to this. It's mine. Well, pizza is also a rivalrous thing in that if there's a pizza on the table and it is owned by one party, they get to eat that pizza. No one else can walk up and grab a slice and eat it. Uh, so that pizza belongs to one party who will consume it. A rivalrous good is something that one person consumes it and everybody else is excluded from it, okay? Once I have possession of this thing, it's mine. Anybody else, I can say, you know, they may want it, but I can say, go away. They're rivals for me in the thing. You eat that slice of pizza, no one else on earth can eat it, okay? Uh, there might be a million people who want to eat it, but only one gets to eat it. So there are a million rivals, one wins, <laughs> okay? Uh, to say a public good is non-rivalrous means it doesn't matter how many people consume the good, it doesn't diminish the good. So there are 330 million, give or take, Americans today protected by the umbrella of our Defense Department. If a baby is born, it doesn't cheapen my being defended by the, the Department of Defense, right? Uh, if, if, you know, there are 10 million more people naturalized as American citizens tomorrow, it doesn't, I don't lose anything from the protection I get. Public goods, therefore, are non-rivalrous. Uh, lots of people can enjoy them, and it has zero or virtually zero diminution of the benefit I get if more people enjoy the benefit of that good because it's a public good. Now, I guess you could have public goods that at a certain point they might be so, uh, you know, it might be that you could eventually reach a point that there were so many Americans that the military we've got 
couldn't effectively protect them all, I, I guess. But those are almost hypotheticals that defy any real world situation. So uh, there you go. Um, it points out in your book that public, that sorry, positive externalities, the spillover effects to a broader world of these things, and public goods are closely related concepts. Public goods have positive externalities. Um, the, remember what an externality is. Is somebody, you know, not party to the direct transaction. A positive externality is something that's a spillover effect. You know, so the Department of Defense buys an aircraft carrier and uh, 330 million Americans benefit from the Department of Defense having the aircraft carrier. So the exchange between the parties was the, you know, the shipyard and the, and the Defense Department, but the positive externality is the protection all of us get from that purchase, okay? So you can see how public goods, things that you know, everybody in the class gets to enjoy the benefits of, are, are often the positive spillovers of other private interactions, okay? Um, the, okay, the, the free rider problem. Now, this is very important. This is one of the reasons why I want a separate lecture. Free rider problem, and rider like in a, a, a person riding on a train. So the train is going from Dallas to Houston. And the train is going, if it's got 150 people on the train, they've all paid for their tickets. And that means the train, you know, it's worth it for the trip to go. The company makes enough money with 150 people on the train to justify the trip. So what if one person sneaks on the train, 150 ticket pay, paying ticket holders, and one stowaway? Well, the 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 stowaway didn't buy a ticket. They did not contribute to paying for the journey to Houston from Dallas. They were a free rider. But what if you have a public good? Let's say, um, well, okay, how about the example of PBS, Channel 13 locally? Uh, that's a quasi-governmental TV station. It gets some money from the federal government to operate. But you all know, if you've ever watched any of Channel 13, periodically they have those pledge drives where people donate money to help the station operate. But nobody checks you as you turn your remote control on Channel 13 to see if you're one of the people who donate. My suspicion is the vast majority of people who watch programs on Channel 13 do not donate to the station. Those people are free riders. The station wouldn't exist were it not for the members who do, in fact, voluntarily donate. But everybody who clicks on Channel 13 gets to benefit from it. So we probably have you know, hundreds of thousands of free riders on Channel 13 every month based on probably what I bet are no more than a few tens of thousands of paying, dues-paying members. So you know, that, that's a, a lot of free riders for a service. If you have too many people who are free riders, eventually the service can't function. If it's, if it's a, well, airwaves are not that big a deal. A lot of people tune in, so what? Uh, but, you know, you could imagine services like a train. Um, you know, if there was a, operated by the, the, the transit authority, like the, the light rail in Dallas, start light rail in Dallas. If all of a sudden, 75% of the people on that train were cheating by not buying tickets, eventually they, that would probably drive the thing out of business, right? Too many free riders, they're, trying, they're providing all the services to these people, but they're not paying for it. So the free rider problem is a big one in public goods. Uh, you got to find some way to get virtually everybody who uses the service to kick in for it. Now, obviously, the main way to do that is taxes. If it's paid for by the government, it's a public good, paid for by the government, then you can make everybody pay taxes. The state has the authority to make you pay your taxes or you get locked up, right? Are you get fined heavily and you better pay or you're going to wind up in a much worse situation. So that's that taxes are a way you can break the free rider problem down, but it means that service has to be tax supported. Okay. Um, the next page 299 uh, talks about the problem with the prisoner's dilemma. And we've seen that problem before. Um, you remember what the prisoner's dilemma is. You've got two guys 
They're sitting in separate interrogation rooms. They've both been arrested for a crime they committed together. But they are each offered a deal. If they will cooperate and rat on their buddy, they get a much easier sentence. Each of them gets the deal. Whoever's the first to talk gets the deal in theory. Um, if they don't talk, there's a decent chance they may skate. They may not go to jail at all if both of them doesn't talk. But if, they, if they're the uncooperative witness, <laughs> they could spend a much longer time in jail. So personally, they have an incentive to rat on the other guy. But if they both kept their mouth shut, they both benefit over the odds of being punished severely. So that's the prisoner's dilemma. But remember what it is, and it points out right out of your book. The difficulty with the prisoner's dilemma arises as each person thinks through his or her strategic choice. Step one, Rachel reasons in this way. If Samuel does not contribute, then I would be a fool to contribute. So they're talking about if, if, you, if you pay for, you know, PBS on the TV. If I pay for PBS on the TV and Samuel doesn't pay for PBS, I'm the one who was losing out here. He gets a free ride, right? However, if Samuel does contribute, then I can come out ahead by not contributing. So if I pay my dues and Samuel doesn't, I'm kind of an idiot for paying for the service financially, just in pure money terms. If he pays his dude dues, I could still get the benefit of the service without paying for it. But then step two, either way I should choose not to contribute and instead hope that I can be a free rider who uses the public good paid for by Samuel. If she doesn't pay, she saves the money she didn't pay. And as at least a 50-50, whatever she thinks the odds are Samuel will actually pay, the service may continue and she pays absolutely nothing for it. But what if Samuel reasons the same way and they both decide not to pay? Nobody pays for the service and the service is never provided. So that's the problem with the prisoner's dilemma. It makes sense for each person to take advantage of it individually, but if they both take advantage of it, poof, the public good is gone. All right, the government role in paying for public goods, uh, the last section there, um, and they talk about the various ways that, you know, straight up tax and spend uh, is very common. It's a public good provided by the government. And, uh, you know, it's 100% paid for with taxpayer money. As there are plenty of examples of that, like the national defense. But you could also have an attempt to have it both ways. Have service, something that's paid for largely by tax, tax dollars. So everybody in this country, everybody in the state pays for. But you also have a user's fee. If you choose to use this service, this public good, then you have to shell out some extra. It's a way of putting people's skin in the game, you might say, so that the taxpayer generally, you may never use the service, doesn't have to pay the whole thing out of their taxes. Think about state parks in Texas. If you want to go to a state park, you got to pay a fee to go in. But those fees don't pay for the whole upkeep of the state park. They pay for a bit of it, a portion of it. Uh, tax dollars from every Texan pay probably the lion's share of every park in the state's functioning. Uh, but if you're going to actually use it, you pay more. And that's a way of making the people who actually use the service uh, kick in more for it than those of us who never may see this park. So that, that might be more equitable. <clears throat> Finally, there are public goods that are prone to what's called the tragedy of the commons. These are public goods, things that everybody can make use of. They are goods that, so they're non-excludable. Um, but nobody in particular is responsible for paying for. So think about, for example, oh, codfish. Uh, fish in the North Atlantic Sea. For hundreds of years, people thought of it as an inexhaustible resource and ships just went out and scooped up codfish by the millions every week. Uh, and, and they nearly destroyed the cod fishery in the North Atlantic entirely. They almost went extinct. It was in every fisherman's interest to go out there and scoop up as much fish as he could. But in the process, they were killing off the good. There was, the only way to preserve the codfish was to make it excludable. 
to have every country in the North Atlantic that has fishermen impose limits or even outright bans on their country's fishermen fishing for cod. So by making them an excludable good, uh, therefore no longer a public good, um, they save the codfish from extinction. And now you can get permits to go fish part of the time. So um, the permits make it a partly non-rival risk good as well because only the people with the permits can go, but everybody with them gets their share. Anyhow, that's all for chapter 13. God bless. Good night.